Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guests today are Anne and Mary Danielson. Anne and Mary Danielson, sister investors with contrasting personalities and lifestyles, have crafted a unique and effective approach to land investing. They have united their distinct skills and values to create a successful lean operation. Operating as a 24-hour superhuman, they manage their business with limited social media presence, a single email, and a shared phone, effectively doubling their business last year. Their story demonstrates how contrasting personalities can synergistically achieve business success while remaining true to individual lifestyles and values. Mary and Anne, thanks so much for joining us. How are you guys today? Doing well. Hi, Kenda. Yeah, we're great. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so exciting to, to get this perspective today. So let's just jump right on in. How did you get started in doing land deals? We got started doing land deals during COVID, like a lot of people. I'm here in the Philippines and we had a really strict lockdown. So one person was allowed to leave the house for an hour a day and you had to stay on your block and wear a mask outside, but you could exercise just right in front of your house. And there was a security guard at each end. So I would just have to march up and down the hill. And I consumed every podcast on the planet and tried to find a way to, to direct my energy. And then I was listening to a lot of bigger pockets. And I think a lot of people start there. And then I stumbled into a guest that was on bigger pockets that led me into the rabbit hole. So I did a ton of research. Um, and then I called Mary and I said, What do you think about land investing? Should we try this? And she said, Sure. And oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. So it's so funny. You hear some people say, I learned how to bake sourdough bread during COVID, and you guys learned how to flip land and run a land business. So I love that. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about how did you learn? You mentioned bigger pockets, you mentioned some other podcasts. How did you have a mentor or a coach? Did you go through a course? How did you guys learn the fundamentals of the land business? We started, like I said, I listened to literally Seth Williams and Land Academy, the Casual Fridays guys. And so I was putting together all the pieces and I am a researcher. I'm a teacher by trade, you can know. Yes. Um, but then I, when I thought, okay, yeah, we can definitely do this. We can make this work. Um, then we did sign up and do Land Academy. And I think we sent our first mailer before we had even finished the program. Right away, we knew that we wanted to start not with a big deal. It wasn't a big deal. I think it was $24,000 or something like that. But for, for us, we knew right away that we were just going to go whole hog from the beginning and use up everything that we had saved to do our marketing and our first deal and then snowball from there. And we actually had to talk that through and we felt good about it. And then we told our mom, called her and said, what do you think about us doing this? And she's used to us fighting and having nothing in common. And so she, she said, yeah, I can, I think that's very interesting that you two are joining forces. And also she gave us a little bit of money actually from the sale of our own family land for, as our seed money. And so we use that to do our first training, our first mailer and buy our first deal. That is fantastic. And so what was it about land that drew you to that specific niche and, and you decided not to flip houses or to buy rentals? What was it about land that, that first attracted you? We had an interesting upbringing because we grew up in Wisconsin and we were in Madison, which is suburbia and, and university and everything that's happening and populated. But our family did have a, a larger a generational property up north and my dad would make us go up there and work it. So we had to walk the land and we had to help with digging when a new outhouse was needed or build a solar shower. And the whole time he's telling us the stories of the land, we hated it. Butchering deer and, and yeah. The it, of when I'm done and gone, when I'm done and gone, <laughs> this land will be yours. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Go on this of years and make sure you understand what it's worth. The land actually, we, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was landlocked and it was the logging roads that are how we accessed our cabin and our property. And so the reason that it was very valuable is because it had silica sand underneath. And so he always said to my mom and to us, like, when I'm dead and gone, 
then make sure you understand who you sell to and what the price is. So I, I have a feeling that seed was um, in our brain from childhood. And so then we realized, oh yeah, there's land is simple, but there are complexities to it that really do affect the value. And so let's learn it so that we can just make that our model and, and make sure that we are buying right and selling right. That is incredible. So can you talk to us a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts of that very first deal that you did? Yeah, it was fun because I was visiting Mary actually in the summer. So I'm in Manila, but in the summertime, I'm back in the States and my family and I make a trip maybe to go visit Mary, who's in Colorado, or to my mom, who's now in Mexico. I saw Yasser's here. Hi, Yasser. He's my mom's neighbor and our <laughs> angel. But I was on that road trip, and I was at Mary's house when we got the first call, and the man, the, the first seller, was from Wisconsin. Right, Mary? Yep. Okay, so you take it there. I've never talked on the phone to anyone. So then this is where Mary has to tell what happened. Yeah, truthfully, it was, it, he was an interesting character, quite easy to deal with. And I don't know, to sum it up, really, it was a great deal in that we learned a great deal. We learned, what did we make on that deal? Like $4,000. $4,000. But yeah. we learned all about calling the county and maybe that we bought too high. Our realtor was wonderful. You gals don't go buying any more land without my opinion, which he was a gem, but those are hard to come by. So I guess all in all, to sum that deal up, it was just, we learned so, so much about the process because I think it's really scary at first to do all the steps. And I don't yeah. know. So I don't, yeah. I so that one as well <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I love that. And what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you were doing that very first deal? Learning curve is pretty high on everyone's first deal. Right. And can you talk to us a little bit about what were some of the challenges for you, whether it was about process or maybe it was mindset, but what were some of those challenges that stuck out to you when you look back at that first deal? I think understanding probably like our offer price and that it can be negotiated from what you sent initially and understanding how and why you're going to negotiate down in this particular case. And then also, I think we got lucky with our realtor on this one, but finding a good realtor is usually the biggest challenge. What would you say? Yeah, I would agree. And I think we, because we didn't have someone walk the property in advance, that's the only deal that we've not had someone do boots on the ground before we have moved ahead. So I guess lesson learned on deal number one, that, that getting somebody out there is key, at least for us. I think the other thing that we learned is that the data, so that's the only deal we ever did in Kentucky, is, is was so hard to come by and nothing was really automated. And it was a huge challenge because everything was a phone call or like physical mail. And so that taught us something too, that if you can go to where the data is easier to navigate, then it saves you a lot of headaches later. Yeah, that was another. Yeah, and helps you ask the right questions. Yeah. You know. To, to get to your new price. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. That's really good. So what types of deals do you specialize in now? If you had to say, this is the type of deal that's our bread and butter in our business, what does that look like? I'm in charge of our data. So we have really unique roles and I do everything that's um, data, research, computer. And then Mary does everything that's stateside, phone, teams, that way. So Colors. for me, when I'm looking at our deals, I'm thinking of, we don't mail anything with a value that's under maybe 60,000. We try for deals that are over 10 acres, obviously all the usual indicators once we get the mail back, but we're on the lookout for subdivides because now that we've done a few, we know that we like it. The process isn't that difficult. We have good teams set up. And so as long as we're looking for properties that are over 10 acres, that could be a, a two parcel split and then upwards um, from there. I would say that subdivides are our current, our current deal to the point that we're even shifting our marketing mm. to more of our friend 
calls it a, our sniper approach. And <laughs> so we were shotgun and now we're more sniper in that we are sending our lists to VAs to scrub for the size of the parcel first. Uh, obviously we can filter that out. That's not really part of the, what they're looking at, but they look at, is there enough land access or road access, sorry. And then from there, they make sure no floodplain, no wetlands, no transmission line through the middle of it. Cause we've already had one of those too. Um, and then if all of those check the boxes, then they look at the topography to see, is this a subdivide candidate or not? And that brings our lists down to probably 15% of what they once were. And then that allows us either to call or mail from there knowing what we're getting back. And I think for, for the front end, from, from my stage of the process, it saves us on mail and on Mary's stage, it saves on not getting calls back from properties that we don't want anyway. And so I know we said that we're all about scaling lean, and that is how we scale lean. Is we that's how we trim the fat. Yeah, that's fantastic. So just to clarify, you have some virtual assistants that are screen scrubbing. So they're pulling, are they pulling every single? Let's say every single property that's on your contact sheet that you're pulling, they're opening it up on some type of map software and they're looking for these physical characteristics. And if there's no road access, we're scrapping it, right? Yep. Yeah. And even to the point of a little road access, we're scrapping it. So Excellent. it has to, they're really quick. They have their two screens open, actually. It's a, a the couple is a fiance, they're, they're fiance, and they have their screens open and they go between map right, land ID, whatever we call it these days, and the data. And they, in, in under a minute, they can do all of those things. So a minute a record. So it's slow and mm -hmm. you have to do backwards planning because if it takes a long time to scrub through all of that data, then you have to have the scrubbers working. Now what I think about is two months ahead of when you need the information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. So if someone's listening to this and they say, you know what, I, we're used to the shotgun approach. We're used to just doing sort of infill lots, maybe some rural recreational, but want to get into subdivides. What was the biggest shift that you had to make mentally and in your approach from moving to from that shotgun method to the more sniper approach of subdivides? Everything is slower when a subdivide is mm. involved because at least where we are, the surveyors are quite far out and the perk guys uh, for us to, once we get down, it depends on which county we're in and how low we're going with the acreage. But if you have to wait for perks. So I think understanding that the process is a little bit slower. Also that the capital required is more and so is the profit. <laughs> and so is the profit. Yeah. Yeah. We're not in the um, speed infill game. I think we're willing to slow things down and to do bigger deals and to take the time for the profit. And that pace feels good for us, maybe because we're ladies, maybe because we're older, but we, yeah, we don't need, we don't need a lot of rapid fire. Wait, so we don't need a, what is that called? Like a ammunition, like the rapid fire. We don't need that shotgun. We don't need that or snipers. Yeah. Right. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. And so what is the typical cash conversion cycle for a subdivide deal that you would do? We did a pretty inefficient one. Would you like to hear about the inefficient? We would love to hear about the inefficient one. <laughs> <laughs> um, our inefficient one started with Mary doing snail mail um, yep. to the because she didn't own a phone. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, no, I ended up making an initial contact with the lady and then her and her son shared a phone and he was at work most of the day. And so I would leave messages for him to call me back. And a week and a half later, they would. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, how do I get a hold of you in a little bit easier fashion? Our title company was ready to like go to their house. You name it. I, I'm not lying. Like we sent everything snail mail, next day mail. Cause it was like, when I talked to her, I'm like, okay, I need to make this phone call count. <laughs> sure. So that was how that one started. And then 
like I said, the day of closing, the title company's calling me like, okay, they called and said they're on their way. They're not here. If they call again, we're going to tell them we'll meet them at their house. <laughs> they ended up showing up. It closed. And that was that. Oh my gosh. And can you talk to us, you mentioned about the margins are higher, obviously in the subdivide. So can you give us some numbers from some of the deals that you've done? What is, what would an average net profit on a subdivide look like for you guys? Sure. Yeah, we can answer that actually, even within this same really inefficient deal. So the, we did get a very good deal on that property. It was about 33 acres. Um, and our purchase price was 62,000 plus 7,000 in back taxes. Um, and so we were right around, I don't know, 71 or something um, on the buy end. And 11 months later, after some detours with realtors, it's been, this is a little bit of an important detail because we chose a realtor in that area because we saw that he had like comps nearby from another split. And so mm -hmm. that's what drew us to him thinking, oh, he's the guy, he understands how this goes and he's just down the road, not realizing that then he would, it was a little bit of a conflict of interest for him. And so he buried our leads and they were only searchable if someone knew the address and the acreage and they called it a farm. You it wouldn't come up unless if, if you were just searching for five acres in this county. And so oh. that was pretty frustrating. He was also a bit of a, a good old boy that would give us a lot of little ladies. You don't understand how it is here, this kind of thing. And that's the only time we've ever encountered that. We ended up having to wait out his contract. And that was the second. The first part of the inefficiency was the seller who was worth the juice and the squeeze because we really did help them out and we were patient. And then the second part was waiting out um, this realtor and the second realtor who also has a special Facebook group. And then she feeds everything through that. So that was a, another tricky situation. All told, long story short, long story long, it took us 11 months to sell out. And I think we ended up at 360,000. Is that right? about that? Yeah. I mean, about it's... that. Yeah. Okay. Mid, mid 300s from a $71,000 purchase. And the only value adds that we had was, were brush clearing and a survey. Brush clearing and a survey. Yeah. Wow. So we could split it. So really it was just to get people on the property and make it visible. Give yeah. Them wow. Congratulations. That's fantastic. I'm sure yeah. it didn't feel fantastic in the moment when you're in the 11 <laughs> months of the back and forth with the, the realtor round robin game and all this other stuff, but sounds like it was worth the wait. Yes, definitely worth yeah. the wait. That's yeah. fantastic. So can you talk to us a little bit about... You mentioned earlier that obviously it takes a little bit more capital to take down some of these larger deals if you're doing, particularly if you're doing subdivide. So how are you guys doing that? Are you using lenders? Are you using private money? How do you raise capital for these larger deals? Until now, we've used all of our own funds. So we just, that first little snowball, we've grown it and we've hardly taken any money out of the company. And so we just keep, you know, rolling it. The other thing is that I do have a home, a rental home in Madison. So we live in it 10 months or no, sorry, that's not true. We rent it 10 months and live in it two months in the summer. So that's considered a, a business. And so I did take out a B lock um, because now that property is fully paid off. We haven't touched it yet, but it's ready. And, and if this deal finally goes through, um, we'll be burning that up shortly. Otherwise, have we borrowed money? Oh, I we just, I did file with Rural First. I haven't gotten all the way through the process yet, but if it works, I think we will try a bank loan um, as well. And Mary, has, has there been any other way that we've gotten funds? We were going to partner. And I think it ended up not going through, but yeah. we oh, tried to partner or we will partner if needed. Yeah, you're right. We were going to JV on a big subdivide that was quite expensive, um, but the land ended up not perking. So the deal fell through. Yeah, you're right. That was going to be a JV, but we haven't done one yet. We funded other people's deals. Actually, yep. we're funding a subdivide right now that isn't too far from um, the one that we just spoke about. 
Yeah. And because of you, Kendall and Alicia, and your master class, that actually really helped us solidify a new approach that we're trying. We tried it twice this week, actually, in terms of partnering with owners. So we originally heard about it as an innovation through the Hive Mind guys. And then when you and Alicia broke it down just in the last few weeks on my workouts, I always listen to your podcasts and then I send myself voice texts and go home and look it up. Okay. And- <laughs> And then she sends it to me. <laughs> and then I send it to me. <laughs> you see, you're like, oh, great. Another, here we go. No, okay. I love it. I love it. That's Another assignment. Favorite. Tell me what's good to listen to. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm a really big nerd and I just, I plow through a lot of information and then I try to filter it in a way of what's applicable to Mary and what will she like and then what will help us. And then we go from there. Um, but anyway, when you guys did do that, I immediately came home and I could see how it played out on the document um, for our offer and how that would stay in a promissory note. And then we would invest in all of the value add out of our capital. And then we could offer the owner either here's your cash price or the post split profit share. And so actually Mary's going to talk to Alicia this week um, yeah, to see so if hopefully she, close if, my if, deal if, this week. To too. Yeah. 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 I Make sure that we're approaching that. it correctly because I'm a little nervous. It's our first go at it, but yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. Like nerve wracking. Cause I'm like, I don't know. And this is really complicated. And then she's okay. She breaks it down for me. I like, love oh, it. Okay. I can do that. It depends on the seller. I think they're, what I'll their do. motivations are and yeah definitely right. sure. that's amazing i love hearing that alicia jarrett is i am such a huge fan i am a huge fan of alicia jarrett she's amazing so i'm glad that you guys got some value out of that for sure she's just a wealth of knowledge yes she's amazing and so are you thanks yeah, i i just oh for real it's great <laughs> I just am so thankful that I get to meet amazing people like you and hear what you're doing in your land business. And we get to geek out about business for a little bit. So super excited for you guys to do that. And here, I, I can't wait to hear how that shakes out. Cause that sounds like it could open up a whole other avenue for you in terms of how you work with sellers. So yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. I think that the thing too, that is awesome about that is after you've done enough deals, you can synthesize like, where is this person coming from? What is the land? Where are they? And in this case, the two sellers that we're looking at trying this with this week, one of them is actually a, a land investor who's moved to another area. And so he's got a lot of projects in another place. So we feel like he might be open to um, this proposal because he'll, he'll He'll understand it quickly, but he also is done with this region. And then the other person is somebody who's inherited the land. He's not, he's mid thirties or something. Yeah, he's uh, quite young. So yeah. I, he's, oh, sure. When I t- mentioned it to him. Yeah. I'm like, okay, and, make sure I have this one. <laughs> he's easy. And he's in another state, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. He's yeah. In ah. yep. So let me ask, how do you explain that structure to a seller in a way that they can understand can you talk to us a little bit about that? I'm going to meet with Alicia tomorrow. <laughs> Got it. Got it. We did write it all out as to what we've learned so far. And when I spoke with him, I just said, I told him straight up, we're new to this. And I want to make sure that I have everything, all my ducks in a row to explain it to you properly and send to you the information that you need and so that I can answer your questions. So please allow me a week. And he's great. Can't wait to hear. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Transparency. And that's will always at go. this point. That's where we're at. Yeah, <laughs> you know? That's fantastic. And so if someone's listening to this and they're like, that sounds really interesting. I've never even heard of any kind of structure like that. Can you talk just a little bit about what your understanding of it is and what you're aiming to do with this type of deal? Sure. Pretty much we're offering the seller two options. I'll I'll talk with the specifics of the the Hilliard. So option one is we would offer him 450,000 cash. He actually told us his title company. So he said, great, your title company, here's the cash price and we'll have a, a 30 to 60 day close. And option two is at the project's close, the offer will be north of 696000 So it's a very conservative underwriting process. And then breaking that down, 
the original 450 offer would go into a promissory note. And then the ad, the value adds of three perks, the survey, the Gosh. attorney's fee for writing up the actual contract, and then the land clearing for the three lots would be subtracted, shared and divided, and then the profits split between the two of us. The question, and this is why Mary is so excited to talk to Alicia, is just how you roll out the basics, right? So the option one and the option two with just the figures versus the itemization of the project. And so we feel like the answer is we want to be very transparent. We're a little bit concerned that if we share all of the nitty gritty details at the beginning, that the seller can e easily say, great, thanks for the idea. And then they can just, now they've got their lesson plan. I'm a teacher. So that I feel like yeah. it is a kind of a lesson. And so we just want to make sure that we build trust and we take our time and then we are clear about everything, but that we unroll it in a way that makes everybody feel comfortable, but also everybody, everybody's protected. Yes. I love that. And so if someone's listening to this and saying, okay, that sounds interesting, but what is the benefit for you if he were to go like with either option, what would the benefit be to you as the investor if you went with option one or option two? Option one is that the, the drawback is we have to come up with $450,000 in 30 to 60, 90 or 30 to 60 days, which that's just a lot of capital to lay out. And then now that we know that subdivides can take a while, then we're out that capital for however long it takes for the project to close. Not only that, but then also the investment for the value adds. Option two means that we don't have to come up with that uh, the initial capital because it's there. It's just set aside for that to pay from the end. Um, and then the draw, uh, we, the only thing we have to come up with, I think it ends up being about 38000 in the prices of all of the value adds. And then the drawback for option two is that we would be sharing the profits of the project 50-50 with the owner. The owner. Got it. And with, is that 450 cash price? Is that retail value for the lot as it sits or is it a discount or what is that? Actually, it is market value. And that is going to be one of the things that we lead with is to say, we are literally bringing you a cash offer for market value. And we wonder, could we get it for less? But I don't think that we could because the seller is one of these people that isn't that highly motivated. He doesn't really need the money right now and he doesn't need it quickly. So that's why also option two might be a good fit for him. But I don't think he'll budge um, for under market value because he's savvy and he can do his research. And, and for us, that's actually part of the draw too and why this is a good model for us. We don't really like low balling and we don't really bargain basement hunting. We actually do being a value add. And so in this circumstance, we haven't yet gone straight to the MLS for these deals, but there's not a reason not to. So once we know our market well, and we know how long the project will take and that, yes, we can get these properties sold in a reasonable amount of time, then it does also help us in terms of marketing to think, okay, we can pluck some of these off of the MLS because the seller is sitting there. And we also might be able to get a better deal if the property has been on the market for a while. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really cool. And you mentioned something about how this particular seller is not very motivated. I think that if anyone's been in the land business for any significant amount of time, we can pretty much tell you that oftentimes you're kind of you're going to come across people that are not quote unquote, motivated to sell their land. And so that was one of the biggest shifts for me because I was coming from a household selling background where these people were like, in dire straits, they had lots of pain. It was like, we need a you know, motivation. You could smell it a mile away. It's very different for landowners. Oftentimes we don't come across that level of motivation. So it's very cool that this allows for, for just opening up that seller pool for the deals that you do. So I'm super excited to see how this shakes out. Please keep us posted. This is very cool. So how many subdivide deals would you say that you do a year? Not a lot. We the 2024 we're, focus. We're, what is that saying? Got it. Oh, it's 
we're yeah we're slow burn people so we yeah. aren't really trying to to cycle through a lot we're really just trying to um focus and i would say at, we would never want to have more than two going at a time hey there land fans if you're enjoying this episode and would like to see more episodes like this please be sure to let us know by liking and subscribing below that's really interesting can you elaborate a little bit more on why would you only want two at a time I work full time. <laughs> so that's a big part of it. I think my my bandwidth is limited. I have the time before school and I have the time after school and then some blocks on the weekend. Um, and for Mary, she has a really involved life too with she has kids that both play club sports um, and she has to drive them everywhere and go to all these tournaments and things. So for us, a subdivide deal is good because nothing is an emergency. And as long as we have two projects going on, I think we can stay, we can give it the time and the energy that it needs and not be flustered and not forget to cross the T or dot an I and still enjoy our life because we are try to be balanced people who travel and enjoy our families. And yeah, that's, what yeah, I that's we very, probably have some smaller deals in the background or yeah. just regular flip or not that we're not trying to get other deals, but as far as like mm. a subdivide was concerned, we would definitely, two's yeah, good. two is good. There you go. Yeah. Cherry pick and yeah, very well. One of the really cool things about that, and it, it makes it even that much more impressive is to hear, oh, you guys did a $360,000 deal while having full-time jobs and living full-time lives. Like it's possible that you can do that. So can you talk a little bit about that balance? How do you balance running a six-figure, seven-figure land business with full-time job, kids, all, all of the things, busy life, travel? How do you balance all of that? A big time optimizer. Like I, before I even found real estate, I was always looking, listening to optimization type mindset, life, life hack type podcasts. And so I do really do a lot of time blocking and Mary does as well. So we think about what are the tasks we have to fulfill and what requires a hundred percent of our focus, or you guys called it a 10 out of 10, nothing else is happening. I'm doing this thing right now. And then what can be done when in, in Mary's case, she's driving her kids everywhere. Can she be calling sellers or if she's waiting in the hockey parking lot, can she be doing those tasks? So part of it is defining what um, what does the task require? And then in a day, what is the window of time that it takes? If it's a short task and you have 20 minutes, what can be done with that 20 minutes? If it is involved, when do you have the time in your week or your day to really dig in? So we take on the weekend um, for sure, either it's usually Mary's Friday night and my Saturday morning. We have about a three to five hour meeting. And that's when we do all of our deal deep dives. And then lately we've been doing all of our accounting and bookkeeping work as well. And so one of our team meetings on the weekend is about that big deep dive. And then the other one is where I am a 10 out of 10, nobody's in here. And I'm really like looking ahead, forecasting, where are we going? What's our market? What's the cycle of our marketing channel? And then that I usually do on Sundays. Along with this, there are some like little life hacks that help on just like a personal front. I don't know if you want to hear about those or not, but absolutely, uh, let's do it. <laughs> uh, so back to my optimization days, it's like you could you have only so many decisions that you can make in a day, and so one of our things that our family has is seven weeks of no repeats of food, and it's on the fridge. And Mondays are something that happens inside of a bowl, a Mexican bowl, an Indian bowl, a Greek bowl. It's not really that complicated if you just think Monday is bowl, right? And then Tuesday is something rice and a, and a, and a grilled meat. <laughs> so it's like these genres, but yeah. it helps so much because for grocery shopping, you only buy what's in the week ahead. And you never eat the same thing twice. And you don't have to say what's for dinner tonight. What's for dinner tonight? Do I have to go to the store? Which I, <laughs> that is annoying. I think like little things like that help. I think also listening to those podcasts when I'm working out, I, it's not really multitasking. It's just that I feel like I'm really able to focus. It makes the time go faster working out. And then I actually have a takeaway. I don't feel like 
I was just, I don't know. It's, I feel like I am optimizing my time. Yeah, I love that. And yes, decision fatigue is a real thing. If that, That's why there are some people, Steve Jobs wore the same black shirt every day. That's one less decision he had to make. So that is a very cool balancing hack. So let's dive deeper into the nuts and bolts of your actual business. So how do you pick a market when you're looking to say, okay, uh, let's start, let's start marketing here. How do you go about selecting and targeting a market? We we're, we stick to one state and we haven't branched out. We do, we, we are feeling like we might have to, but we just don't want to. And so the markets that we're choosing are markets that are either staying the same or growing. Markets where the 90 day solds are reasonable compared to the ratio, the sold to sale ratio is favorable. And I did shift to 90 days since, you know, markets have changed. I think when we started out, we maybe we're at a year, then we were at six months. And now I just think, oh, I just want to look at the last 90 days. And let's see, there's a couple of places too, that we do that we've just eliminated because of the topography. So we're in a place where if, if everything comes back on the side of a mountain, it makes the process really hard for our markets. We do, we have left out a few mountains. <laughs> Got it. And the, for those 90 day sell through rates, what would you consider to be favorable? That's all relative, right? I don't, I actually have no idea of how it compares to other places in the country, but within the region, the one that I did yesterday, I think everything was above a one to, one to three. Okay. 30 like about, right around the 30%, I think was the low end of that. And if I back out, sometimes if I'm like, oh, I'm not sure, then I do look at six months and a year to see, is it going to sell? It just takes longer, but yeah, what is this? What is the sell through rate? Excellent. And so when you are looking for, for deals, you mentioned your criteria was uh, a minimum of 60K that you looked for 10 acres and above, is there a max uh, of the value of the property or you just set a minimum and you take everything above that? We, <laughs> it's funny that you asked that because this is the question. We, we are wondering this as well because now we've pretty much maxed out our private capital and for us to go bigger, things are coming our way that are larger deals. And we have them in this column of, the big dog deal and figuring out, is there a way that we can take them down? And then what is our, what's our structure going to be? Are we going to team with somebody else? Are we going to just try to get some bank financing? That's exactly our question, Kendall. Got it. <laughs> so keep us posted on that. So <laughs> what was your ceiling before you just said, okay, let's look at some big dog deals. What was your ceiling before? In terms of market value, I would say... We always, from the beginning, mailed up to 250000 market value. Okay. Uh, and then I th it wasn't that long after that that I just didn't, I didn't put an end point. I just, yeah. We're like, ready. Why? We're, we're why? Why? Well. Why? Figure it out. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. So let's dig into your marketing method. So you mentioned mail. Are you doing any other type of marketing, ringless voicemails, text messages? What Talk to us about what your marketing strategies look like. We've only mailed an, a two-page blind offer until last December. Our actual mail piece is was not based on a template. I'm an artist, so I don't really like to follow anybody's anything. And <laughs> so we, we made it up because that's just what you do in land investing. You just make it up. Yeah. And it's I think it, that has really worked well for us. We Last year, we had an offer for every 1,908 pieces of mail, wow. which I actually feel quite good about. I think that so I think that number is good. Uh, now, keep in mind, we only mailed 18,507. Yeah, we didn't, we don't mail a lot, but until last December, we only mailed. Last December, we decided to take it off 
um, of mailing because of a lot of the reason a lot of people do that maybe it's the holiday, maybe people are getting too much mail and they're not checking it. We both had big vacations planned and we didn't really, we wanted to just enjoy the holiday. And so we did switch to cold calling for the first time in December. How is that? How is that? Mayor? <laughs> We've mixed feelings. Okay. Over, overall, of course, there's more, we get more leads and there's a lot of really good properties. I think sometimes though, there's just like a little bit of a language barrier. And so mm. sometimes I'm like, are they serious? Are they being sarcastic? Because when I try to call them back, like the lead sounds wonderful. And then they're like, no, but we have had some really good leads from it. There's more leads and it definitely probably made us decide, yep, let's do subdivides because we have options. I feel like there's more options and, and better properties. However, yeah, so have to been, uncover them. I'm sorry. It's been taxing for Mary in terms of how many people she has to call back and then find out if they're actually motivated, which obviously isn't the case with mailers. The difference is that if our model is that we can come closer to market price, like Mary said, because it's a good subdivide, then those are the kind of leads that we will get from cold calls. If we are able to feel them out and either team with them, like you're teaching us to do, or we know that there's a value add and we can come closer to market, then we call it We're also the we're in the slow burn with a few yeah. of those. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really excellent point that you bring up is I think a lot of people, like when we think about what marketing strategy we want to use, it's it, one of the things that's often overlooked is it's not just what gets leads, but also what do you have the bandwidth to process those leads when they come in? So I know a lot of people like mail just because it is a little bit slower because they, they have a little bit more time to be able to handle those leads versus, okay, you got 31 leads and you need to make calls within the, the next 12 hours <laughs> to get those right. leads. Interesting. Do you retarget your mail pieces like or is it just one and done how does what does that cadence look like for you i'm feeling better about our cadence because we were tone deaf and <laughs> until now uh, it was a little bit like oh how about this one how about this one based on when i did the the market research what was looking good but that was also because in our first year we didn't we knew we were going to try this state and then we just bopped around and then a major shift happened with cold calling because it is so many, you, you need so many records, right? It's just like a really quick burn rate. And so in that way, I thought, wait, there has to be a funnel that work, that we work through for this to make sense. And so now I do have a, a clear calendar of what's where and cycling back. So last year I did mail once at the beginning of the year, once at the end of the year. And then before remailing, I just checked that, that the market was still where we want to be. And I treated it like a NCAA bracket. Okay. <laughs> and so, so they would, the county would move ahead, but actually there might be a Cinderella story and a new county has shown up. And so now they, I might add them and somebody else might, well, they might get their butt kicked and now they're not in the tournament anymore. Okay. And so I'm still using that there's this funnel or this channel, but also staying current with the market to say, yeah, they've done well in the past. Is there somebody else now that we need to be paying attention to? Excellent. That's very cool. Very cool. So when you're talking with sellers, it sounds like you guys are, are able to pay close to market value. You're not trying to negotiate people down to where you're getting this, getting this property for pennies on the dollar uh, per acre. But what types of follow-up processes and negotiation processes do you go through when you are nurturing a lead? Oh, I don't know. I guess I just start with my initial call and try to figure out exactly why they're selling, if they know the neighbors, what's their motivation. And then I usually just end with, I'll get back to you. Take away whatever information that they gave me to see if we are able to maybe negotiate. And then usually I call back and I, 
after talking with Anne, I'm like, okay, she's nope, this is where we're at. So then it gives me a little bit more confidence to just say, this is our offer. And I understand if you can't take it, but here's my number. And I think we got one phone call back actually a couple of weeks ago that it was like, Hey, what'd you guys decide? I'm like, I talked to you three times and told you this is our number. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm not convinced that he actually has that other buyer. So mm. I'm assuming that I'll hear from him within the next month. Yeah. <laughs> and we, yeah. we send them like cookies. Yeah. We sent right? some cookies. You're right. <laughs> Okay, I have to hear about this cookies cookie. Work. This is a, a cookies. Okay, so talk to us about the cookies, cookies follow up strategy. Okay, so you gotta hear sometimes, about sometimes, like I said, when I talk to my callers, I do try to listen to their story very closely. And sometimes we send cookies if they're maybe a little older or lonely. One time I sent a a friendly bird to a little lonely lady. Yeah. Just because sometimes we sweeten the deal. Yeah. I don't know. What would you say, Ann? <laughs> well, actually, that, that cookie guy that I'm thinking about, he yeah. keeps our cookies in the freezer and he takes them out when his grandkids come over and he eats the cookie. Why not think about the Danielson girls when the grandkids come over? Every time. Exactly. Every time. Maybe you're ready now. Yeah, give us a ring. I yeah. do remember that from Joelle and her cookies. Yep. Uh, yeah. That anyway, is so cool. We send cookies. That's a good, so what kind are these like crumble cookies or what kind of cookies are we talking about here? We said sweet, sweet girl. girl. Say it again, which kind? Sweet girl. We heard about them from one of our groups that Ed is in as well. And she just said, yeah, sometimes I just send cookies. And I'm like, what is she talking about? And then I'm like, we're sending cookies to this guy. It's going to be great. We don't yeah. send them to everybody. They're not a cookie. Sure. They're they're not expensive, but they're not cheap. Yeah, what we're like we we kind of the title companies too. When yes. we've been a in the butt for the title company, sometimes too, we send donuts or cookies. Or I think some one time they said, "Thank you for all your gifts, but we preferred Chick Fil A." So we're like, "Okay, yes. you no." Know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hate for a gift to go to waste. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Noted. It's too funny. <laughs> But that's really great because it really does speak to considering what is your customer experience like. And I think that that's just brilliant. It's so good. Let's talk a little bit about your dispo process. Whenever you are taking these deals down, obviously you're buying them, you're holding them, you are using a real estate agent to sell these properties, right? It sounds like You've had quite a lot of experience with different uh, real estate agents. And so what are some of the uh, tips that you can give us in terms of how you find and source really good real estate agents to work with? Hmm. We, we, yeah, we have had a big, a lot of experience. Our first agent that we loved, we now we call him bad boyfriend because he is so good and then he ghosts and then he comes back and he's so good and then he ghosts and he comes back. <laughs> but we bad have a lot of nicknames, okay? Bad we boyfriend. We have, like, he's a bad bad boyfriend. boyfriend. Yeah, and we keep him around because we bought a deal for 27 that he ended up selling to the U.S. government for a housing project. And so he was a bad boyfriend then too because he said, this is a great deal. Just take it. You don't need all the details. And we're thinking, well, we don't really operate that way. And we don't like it felt we were worried it was like a Russian investor or something. Cause ah. said, we can't, I can't tell you the, their identity. Just believe me when they get to this stage of the due diligence, I'll let you know. And so he's a man of mystery, bad boyfriend, mm -hmm. and he comes and he goes. Um, but we do keep him around because there's a certain property that that he's perfect for. And he's really good with large, rural, recreational, um, expensive land. So Bad Boyfriend has a place. And then <laughs> um, we have a couple of dingbats. The dingbats are all, we will use them if we have a small owner finance type deal in their area, because why not? They're nice enough and we just keep them around. And then we have our like, Mary's land crush oh. guy. 
He is my crush. I love him so much. Oh, but yeah. I think truthfully, like this, my land crush is he just it, he's just responsive. A number one, if they do not respond, move on. <laughs> like literally within 24 hours, they are realtors. Realtors work literally all week, every day, all the time. The other thing is, I think, just being really honest about what you're doing, because some of them are like, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? And I get that. But if they aren't willing to walk the property without all of the purchase agreement and everything like that, even though we have permission, that's OK. But it's actually really seeking your opinion because we're conflicted. We can see everything on the computer and we let them know that. But we need you to walk it. And if you're not willing, then you're probably not our best land realtor so so this so the, the area that, literally they'll come back and tell you oh yeah i know right where that is and that's awesome there's just so many things they can say that you're like no way or absolutely great they already know where it is or they already tried to sell it and they're telling you from the get-go don't buy it that was hmm. actually a bad boyfriend last week he's like, nah, i've already been there and and interesting like that just take their trust okay. your butt <laughs> Yeah. So, so that's actually a good life hack too, or like a good tip um, is when you have the person that you can count on for that county or for that region. Now we just have a, a running record um, and it's a table that has the properties that we're considering and we give them a shared link to it. When they have time, they can go in or if they think, oh, I'm going to be in that neighborhood, I'll drop by. Um, and then if something is a fire, it gets a fire emoji. And then we tell them fire, don't just check it when you're fire leisure. leisure. This time, <laughs> yeah. yeah, this time you get, get over there. And so I would say that we have three, two and a half mm -hmm. all stars that, that they have their own document that we share where we're just continuing to populate it. And then they can give us feedback when they're there. Excellent. So you're actually using agents that you will potentially be listing with if you were to get this deal under contract. You're using those people as boots on the ground sometimes in the due diligence process before you even lock up these deals. Yes, absolutely. And then when they're in our like golden land crush domain, we will also throw them all the leads that we don't want because they're too overpriced or it's not in our buy box or whatever. So we've also brought them deals. Um, and so it's a super solid, mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Sounds like so much synergy. And gosh, especially in this, the remote type of business that this is, it's incredible to have people in that market. So that's really awesome. Talk to us about what do you think consider to be the most important needle moving activities in the land business? I think we each have one. <clears throat> Calls, <laughs> contacts, making contact. Yeah, Mary says contacts and mine is leads. Excellent. If you're not getting leads, if you're not making calls, not happening, yep. right? <laughs> really good, really good. And so what do you consider to be the biggest challenge in the land business? I think most people would probably give the same answer that it's not steady. It's, you can say, run it like a business and all of those things. And you can project a lot of fake projections, <laughs> but really we can't control how balanced the business is in a lot of ways. And so we're always figuring out how to manage capital and plan ahead when we can. Yeah, I think it's just balancing the balance. Yeah, we just can't mm -hmm. control it. A wave. Yeah. There are variables that are definitely not within our control, even when we do all the right things, which I think is can be what's super frustrating about land sometimes is that the real estate in general, you can do all of the right things. And for whatever reason, you just have a month where you get no deals, right? So that definitely get that. So what do you think, in your opinion, is something that no one or very few people in our industry are talking about that we should be talking about in the land industry right now? I know you said earlier and the, the surveys, <laughs> or maybe that's just for us. Yeah, you're right. 
Actually, we were talking about, because we always are struggling with the how far the surveyors are out, is anybody moving towards desktop surveys? And is there another way to... to Our secret. They, what do they call it? They call it, is it a desktop survey or is it a GIS survey or a, I don't know. But I, I this is something that I want to find out about. Is there a way to do that? And will the counties recognize um, these surveys? Because I think that would be really helpful. Um, the other thing that we were talking about, and not a lot of people are talking about it, is um, when land is landlocked. And so all of us are tossing these away. And so not enough people are talking about easements by necessity. And is there a systemized way to do that? Because that could easily become somebody's niche um, or niche. And then the other, <laughs> the other thing we were talking about that nobody is talking about is land that doesn't perk. And so because we had that giant, beautiful deal that would have been massively profitable, but isn't because of the soil, we wondered, should we make this our deal? Should we become the people who figure out the alternative septic? And then now we just take these two counties that are so problematic and we solve that problem. But we don't really want to be the septic, septic sisters or the shit sisters. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> but we decided to do subdivides. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Got to keep the alliteration, got to keep the branding going. The right. system. Right. There's got to be something with an S. Right. I mean, something with an S. That's not the S. That's not the S that we want. Uh, I think all of those things, just keeping, I think the land investing group as a whole, we're quite old and archaic in our ways. And so we are learning a lot from the house wholesalers that are coming over and the, the bra, all the little frat boy groups that are out there talking about their ways and doing infills and all of that. But I think we do have to stay a little bit current and just always be looking to say, okay, so where is a problem? And then is it, am I the person to solve that? Mm. So speaking of problems, what are deal killers for you? You mentioned landlocked, but maybe not. So what are some of the deal killers for you whenever you're looking to analyze deals? But yeah, landlocked, we don't have the capacity for them. We put them in the landlocked column, if anybody's and sometimes interested. sometimes we do neighbors. We've done neighbors. And we've been yeah, successful true. with some neighbors. You're mm -hmm. right. We have, you're right. I would say for Anne, a deal killer is the mountainside. Mm. And I live in Colorado and I'm like, every time I drive somewhere, I'm like, but wait, what if that's the topography of the mountainside that we're throwing away in my head? So I, I'm trying to solve that mountainside issue because I think there are wonderful places to build. However, it's expensive. Yeah. We've Excellent. tried to do some roads to get them into the mountainside, but... Anne was not a fan. And the no did there. <laughs> Mountain, no, no, no mountains for no. sure. No wetlands. <laughs> I'm sure people do want it for duck hunting. It's just we haven't really done. I think we thought we were going to do like the hunting land, but we haven't. Got it. Got it. So, and so, what is your definition of success? Go ahead, Annie. I think it's when you just get. The life you want to live and the freedom in your day and the enough money that you can make the choices you want to make. Yeah, I think for, yeah, I'll, I'll always travel even if I'm broke. Um, but I think for me, success is being able to travel, be present for my family and do what I like and quite honestly, not work for somebody else. I think that's the part that I, I'm not successful yet because I still have a day job. I'm really successful. I only work for my sister. Just mm -hmm. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree. I agree. Like for me, not working for somebody else, freedom with my family, especially as we do approach, we love the sports world. It's expensive. So I don't need a lot of money, but I need enough money to do what we want to do. So yeah, success to me. Freedom. Beautiful. Freedom. Beautiful. Freedom. And what would you consider to be your superpower? I think we call ourselves a superhuman and it's awesome because 
I work all day and Mary's sleeping and then she works all day and I'm sleeping. So I think that is unique to our model is that we just operate as one human who's carrying the torch through the day and the night. But it might be because we're women. I'm not sure if it is or not, but we don't really care what anyone else is doing. And we don't really care where we fit in or yeah, if we're moving with the tribe, we just do what feels right for us. We grew up and we were the girls in the gun club and now we're the girls subdividing land and we just make it up. We find a way that works for us. We don't give a shit about anybody else. Mayor? Yep. <laughs> there we yep. go. That's a good superpower. That's a really good superpower. <laughs> so we don't care. Just kidding. We, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care. That's our superpower. <laughs> Couldn't we care less. Ask. Enjoy it. We do enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. We do that might be a superpower just because we really do like it and we like can't wait to talk about the deals or that are coming in. And so that's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And so are there any authors or thought leaders or influencers, business owners that you really like to listen to, consume their content, read? Who who inspire like who do you like to look at? Um, well, I like to listen to Alex Hermosi. Yeah. Um, and especially because we're like, just to get out there and do it type of, uh, that's our mentality as well. And I just think that his perspective on self-love is holding yourself to the higher expectation than anybody else. I think that I really like the personal accountability, um, of the way that he speaks, um, to everyone and, and just his straightforwardness about it. And I would like to bring up a novel. Yes. Because I, the first time I read it was more than 25 years ago. And I, I still think about it before I go into any important conversation. So it's The Pillars of the Earth mm, by Ken okay. Follett. So it's a very long book. It's over 900 pages. It's such a good read. But I still think about it when I'm playing chess or I'm talking to anybody. It's not... The next decision you make, it's three moves out that matter. So when you're making a big decision or you're having a big conversation, thinking about what do you want the outcome to be and then backwards planning from there and then thinking, so what do I do now to get me to that place? And so it's, there's all these complex relationships and webs and things in this book that I still think about, like how, what do I have to do now to get to what I want the outcome to be? even more than any business book. That's great. That sounds like it's right up my alley. I love stuff like that. I was really. going to write it down until she said 900 pages. You're like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Not happy. Uh, sorry, but facts here. Maybe you could get the the abridged version or the uh, or, or the or audio that. version. Yeah. I have a lot of hockey drives. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Google's chat GPT. Tell right. me about the choice of the earth. <laughs> Love it. I love it. And so what's been the biggest surprise so far that you've had in your land journey? That we're really that doing it. I was going to say that. That we I can mean, that do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's remarkable. Does it still, do you still have to pinch yourself when you hear, yes, we did a deal for 200 and, or $360,000. Yes. That's remarkable. That's incredible. Mary gets really mad because I always say, what are we doing in our fake business today? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it feels fake, especially when we have to do the taxes stuff. I'm like, oh. Yeah, you this know, is not fake. Taxes here. and payroll? Like what? This is, mm -mm. I'm just yeah. pretending. Yeah, but it's true. I love fake that. Business, so but it's a real one. And I think we're doing okay. We're doing and I think business. you almost get to work for yourself. Almost. So you mentioned payroll. Can you talk to us a little about what your team looks like in your business right now? You're looking at them. It's yeah. the two of us. Um, we recently have two VAs. Um, and then we have my daughters that are not that helpful, but bright. If I need them to do something, I can make them clock in. Or if they need something, they broke their iPhone and they need a new one. I can make them run comps and do things. And we do pay our kids, actually. That is part of our... We, done some restructuring with our LLC and S corp elections to make sure that we can actually use them in a way that is strategic and they need the life skills, quite honestly. So my kids Hopefully help sometimes. They do the same someday. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. That's true. So yeah, we have two VAs. My kids, sometimes we have a CPA and a bookkeeper. We rely heavily on our dispositions teams that are the brokers that we have these relationships with. But have we hired anyone else, Mary? Not yet. And you're looking kind at of stuffy on the hiring. Yeah. Hey, that's okay. Perfect. Keep it. Hey, keep it lean. Like I'm you just. Little, yeah. You know. Like we are lean for sure. And I, not that I don't trust anybody, but like I said, even with the land caller, I'm like, but I think they're missing some sarcasm here, and it bothers me. <laughs> so someday I'll relinquish, and we'll probably have to maybe let some people at least go through well, our leads for us. Yeah, and if you don't still great. It's just, it's always so fascinating to see different structures and how people do it. There's no one right way or wrong way to do it. So I just love that you're able to create a business that like supports the life and supports your vision that you have for success. And that's so cool. So what is it that inspires you or makes it, makes you feel like your best self? For me, I was a little lost when we began doing this. So I love that. I just have a purpose every day. And to be honest, it brought Anna and I closer together. And I think for me, it just having a purpose and being proud of myself and showing my children that there's more to mom than mom. That's (laughs) cool. Yeah. And I think for me, the moments that I stop and think about it, are when we're taking family vacations. We travel a lot. And like when we're in New Zealand and we're hiking and I see my kids and we're healthy and we're all together and like the life we've built, that it, it's purposeful. I think that's when I feel like my best self. Yes, enjoy this because you worked freaking hard to get here. Ah, that's so good. So good. I want to thank you so much. You guys have just given us so much value and knowledge and experience today. And so what is it that you're looking for? How can we give back to you? What types of connections or resources you're looking for that we could help with? Until now, we've really kept to ourselves. I think we haven't branched out. We haven't gone to conferences. We haven't been very active on social media. We just had our our teeny little core group. I think the that we what we would hope is that we can maybe meet some new people and make some new connections because we are ready to grow and to team up and to do some bigger deals. And we just have to come out of our shell a little bit and yeah, get get outside of our little two Z operation here. <laughs> Love it. Excellent. And one last question for me. So if you could go back and tell yourself one to two pieces of advice when you were first getting started in your land industry, in in the land industry, what would those pieces of advice be? Take the shot. Just, just, just take it. Just go for it. Don't think about it. Take the shot. Yeah. Like Um, I maybe would have quit my job sooner and like just dove in, take the risk. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what we did, could have done differently, but I think we just learned because we did it wrong or whatever. So I guess I don't know. I don't have a great answer for that. Yeah. Do it and keep learning. Yep. Ask questions, actually ask questions and use people. This community is so fun and so awesome and so helpful. And literally, like we said, we're funding a deal that just came from answering a simple question and ask the question you might have a funder right there (laughs) or or you might i don't know have a realtor a good one yeah you could have questions and use the communities probably we probably didn't do that enough in the beginning because we were like oh they're gonna think we're dumb so that might be my piece Yeah, that's great. No, that's one of the things I love so much about the land industry is that there are so many incredible people that are just willing to give and just so generous and and just really gracious people in in the land industry. And I would echo that. If I could do something over again, it would be learn more people faster, (laughs) like figure out who they are and just plug in. So thank you so much, Danielson sisters. You've been amazing. Anna and Mary, you really have just been so cool. And it's just 
amazing to see what you've done and how you've built out your businesses and to see what you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's joined us and we will catch you in the next one. Until then, be safe, take care and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they've built and run their businesses, then check out my group, Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.